Why, hello, Jeff. Why, hello, Soraya. How are you doing this evening? You know, I was just out for a stroll <gasps> in my house oh. behind <laughs> closed doors. <laughs> nice. nice. I don't go very far these days. Yeah, yeah. My big trip is to the mailbox. And it's... Yeah, that's a big one. Yeah. Yeah, and I've been doing a lot of yard work in my backyard for some reason. It's my opportunity to get outside right now. So, so this episode should be really fun. We're having back on the show Steve Wynn from the Dream Syndicate. Yeah. Well, you know, new album is coming out on April the 10th. Yes, yes. And this week on Wednesday, the 25th, The Longing. Oh, yes. Is coming out. Yes, I can't wait to find out more about that. So, they so <clears throat> with a brand new video. So, yes. um, fun times. And, you know, with Steve Wynn, there's always, we always learn things. Yes. So, let's knock it out. Let's call him. Let's do this. Hi, this is Soraya. And this is Jeff. Our podcast is called Paisley Stage Raspberry and Rhyme. A podcast where the two of us play music that we like and share anecdotes and background about the tune. We hope you'll join our conversation. And without further ado, agroviar. Let's get groovy. All right. West Coast calling the East Coast. Hello. Hello, Steve. This is Jeff and Soraya. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. How are you doing, Jeff and Soraya? We're doing pretty good. <laughs> isolated yeah, in our yeah. own homes. We're all safe, sound, and isolated. <laughs> safe, sound, and isolated. <laughs> that sounds like an album title. <laughs> there you I go. Might have to borrow, I might have to borrow that one. <laughs> safe, sound, and isolated. <laughs> it works for It works for us. And it, uh, our... well, it, it, it's gonna it's gonna it's gonna have to work. <laughs> <laughs> so for our listeners on uh, joining us today, of course, is Steve Wynn from the Dream Syndicate and so many other projects. And in case you haven't been connected to social media, just like everybody else, also did a fantastic Facebook Live concert for the Jeremy in Milan last week, and it's. Uh, uh, you need to see that. And Steve says, maybe, Thank you. maybe there'll be more, um, which we'd absolutely love. And it's a wonderful um, statement of solidarity with so many people in Europe, um, here in the States and everywhere else that, you know, we're all sequestered, but desperate for connection. And that Facebook Live concert, uh, Jeff and I agree, was just a wonderful way to connect. So thank you That's so much crap. for that. You're welcome. I mean, I think that it, it, you're seeing you know, a lot of people, a lot of musicians, all kinds of people doing things like that. And I think, it's a, yeah, you're right. We're hungry to connect. And also, it's what we do. It's like, you know, I mean, I was supposed to be right now, um, let's see, I would, right now I'm supposed to be in Norway, in the Arctic Circle, at a festival called the uh, the, the Snow Station Vodso Festival up there with um, a bunch of friends with, with Scott and Peter and Mike and Linda from the Baseball Project and Hal Gelb and Peter Parrott, the only ones. We were going to be spending a week up there. That's not happening. And I was going to come back and do a solo tour here in the U.S. for two weeks. It's not happening. And going to be out there getting ready to, to play shows for the new Dream Stick album. For now, not happening. So, you know, every, I mean, everybody's got challenges and problems. And it's, and it's you know, there's, there's a litany. I mean, there's a left and right. But um, for musicians, we like to play we like to play for people we like to get out there and do our thing and travel and sh show up in new cities and embrace the random every night and find that you know thing that's going to make this night different from the other 3,000 shows you've played in your life and that's a real you know addiction hunger obsession you whatever a need and I think you know in the meantime we're getting it from playing in front of you know an iPad propped up on a table and, and <laughs> pulling out a guitar and and Feeling, feeling something like that. And it's funny thing is I'd never done that before. Um, I know you mentioned it, was, it's for, it is for a place in Italy, in Milan, called Jeremy, um, which means you know, germ, strangely enough, appropriately. It was started a year ago by um, um, a couple friends of mine, um, Manuel Agnelli and Rodrigo de Rosmo from a band called After Hours. And we've played together, toured together, and... Um, um, they're in, actually in the, the biggest 
the biggest band in Italy. Band After Hours is huge, and they're also on um, X Factor, the, you know, the, the, the reality TV show over there. So they're, mm-hmm. they're pretty well known, and they opened this really cool bar club over there a year ago, and I was one of the first people to play there. So when they came to me and said, look, we want to kind of keep the club going in any way we can, so we're going to do these shows, simulation of what would be happening if you came to the bar. It's like, great. I was into that. So I tried it out, and it was wild because, you know, I mean, you know, it was one o'clock in the afternoon here in New York, and I was playing and looking at the screen because you see yourself playing. And what I found out later, everybody's left-handed now. All these people are doing this <laughs> for some reason. It flips you on your iPad. So we're all, everybody in the world is a left-handed guitarist. We are, we are all Kurt Cobain now. <laughs> and, um, and, and we're, it's crazy. You know, this, I didn't, I think I have, a, I think I have a way to get around that in the future. I think I figured out the solution to that. But um, what I was seeing while I was playing was, with the comments from people and all the, you know, people were tuning in. I would see people who I, you know, friends of mine, people I know as fans, people I've, you know, encountered online, whatever, showing up and saying hi. And I'm, I'm trying to remember the words of my songs and get completely <laughs> thrown off the whole time. It's like, oh man, look who's there. Jason's watching now. Oh, look at that. You know, that's hilarious. But it, it was fun. Yeah. Yeah. It looked, you looked very comfortable and it. it looked even for being a different environment. It, it was a lot of fun. I had a blast watching that. Yeah, yeah I kept making okay. comments, too, and then I'm like, should I be doing this? <laughs> I'm like, great song, great song. <laughs> yeah, that no, was Well, great. please do, because I, I am going to do it again. You mentioned that, and um, I mean, I did this one for for the club in Milan, but I'm, I'm going to do them on my own Facebook page. Um, I don't know when, period, probably one, um, you know, in the coming days, and probably, you know, until until we can, you know, go out and, play shows and see each other and hang out together and do the things we love to do, I'll probably keep doing them. It's, it's, it's fun. And, um, you know, it's, I have a, a, a really good in-house drummer here quarantined with me, so maybe we'll, <laughs> maybe we'll do some stuff together. Nice. Yes, you do. <laughs> it's helpful. It's helpful. Yeah. So, it, is, so it, is, it is. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we, first of all, we're just excited, and I think a lot of our listeners are too, because despite being in our homes and quarantined and uh, isolating and staying six feet away, there's new music out there, and so there's stuff for us to really look forward to, and one of them is The Universe Inside with a release date of April the 10th, and then right. the, the new... Now, yeah. yeah, and then the new single coming out, uh, the new release, of The Longing, Coming up, am I right on Wednesday, March twenty fifth? Right, I think I think it's since we are you're airing this on Friday, it'll have just come out. Right. So it is now, it is for your listeners listening right now, and um, it, it's online. It's um, the single and video is out. So there's two. The first two singles from the album are out um, on whatever streaming platform or download platform or YouTube or whatever. It's in and the and the, um, and the videos are are, are wild. We, we can get to that later, but that's, they're, they're yeah. all out there. And then the album, yeah, in two weeks, and still, in fact, I just wrote today to um, our label, Anti Records, and I, I checked in, because like, you know, I don't have, you know, it, I should preface by saying, you, you the, we've been writing back and forth, Jeff, you and I have been writing back and forth about this. I was nervous to do this interview, because, not because I, because I, I mean, I don't get nervous about interviews or much of anything, but I was afraid that anything we said would be completely dated and wrong by the time the show aired, and, um, I know this show is airing four days after our conversation. Is, is, am I demystifying the process here by no, 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 not no. live? Okay, good. <laughs> no, that's right. I need to just... transparent. Don't worry. It, it's funny. I, I, I will digress, as I like to do, by saying the the online concert a couple of days ago. A lot of people have written to me and said, "Oh, I'm so sorry, I missed it. Let me know when it's gonna when you're gonna do it again." I said, "Well, it's there. You can see it any time." But I think people have this thing sometimes where they want to experience it in the moment, which I totally get. So I keep saying, it is, yeah, go watch it. It's like, pretend I'm doing it right now. But <laughs> so, so for all people listening to this, imagine no matter when you're listening to this podcast, whether it's 2 in the morning or 5 in the afternoon or happy hour or when you can't sleep, it's live. No matter when you listen, <laughs> we're having this conversation right now. Yes, so, we are. How's yes. that? that, I, love know, that. I brought back the mystery to it of live radio, which I'm a big fan <laughs> of. But anyway, um, I was I was hesitant to, to do the show because I was afraid anything I say on a Monday might be completely wrong by Friday. So um, I will say that just today I, I wrote to our label, to Anti-Records, and I asked 
so was this record still going to be coming out on April 10th? And they said, yeah, it'll be, um, you know, released. It'll be, of course, you can't go to a store and buy it. You can order it from your favorite local store or um, any place you get music. And, and, you know, whether it's streaming or whatever, we don't care. Just listen to it. Very good, very good. I'm super excited for this to hit the streets, as they say, even though, like you mentioned, it, most of us will be ordering online, and some of us pre-ordered online, so that's available it'll now. The, it'll be hitting the street with disposable gloves. So you're... <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, so we've been fortunate enough, Soraya and I, to be, have listened to this for the past six or seven weeks, and I gotta tell you, Steve, my favorite song changes from day to day. Yeah. But um, I would like to go through the songs. Um, but first of all, if you wouldn't mind, can we talk a little bit about the lineup on this album? Because there's one slight change, isn't there? Um, well, you know, yes. And it is, we keep adding people. We've, the, the, we've had the same core lineup now for going on eight years of, of me, Dennis Duck, Mark Walton, and Jason Victor, which is exciting because we didn't do that the first time around. But we added Chris Kakavis as a full-time member with How Did I Find Myself Here three years ago. And on this record, um, Stephen McCarthy is pretty much a member of the band on this record. He was there for the entire recording of it. And he's, he, was, he was already very much a part of these times, the last album, because he did a really incredible backing vocals that kind of really shaped that record a lot. It really had a big part of what made that record what it is. But this time he's there with us from start to finish. Very good. And our listeners will know that Stephen McCarthy is from The Long Riders, among other things. Um, you guys even had a project yeah. together with Gutterball. I mean, we've done a lot together. I mean, Stephen and I go way, way back. Um, Gutterball, Danny and Dusty. Um, and probably, and I imagine some of your listeners, since they're pretty savvy on these things, might know that Stephen sort of replaced me in The Long Riders. I was, I was um, around the time... The Dream Syndicate was starting um, out in the early 82 out in L.A. Um, I was also playing a band with Sid Griffin and um, and Barry Shank and, hope I get this right, Matt Roberts on drums as a band that became the Long Raiders. But um, I was doing both at the same time. Now, I, I will, I will re- rewind a, a little bit there to say that S- Sid Griffin was in a band called The Unclaimed out in L.A., which... Again, I think probably a lot of your listeners will know, which was the one of the few and garage bands, bands playing garage rock in L.A. in, the, in 80 and 81. So I was a huge fan. And when they broke up, I I knew Sid a little bit from going to the shows, from him shopping at the record store where I worked. And I said, man, whatever you're doing next, I'd love to be part of it. And he said, OK, OK, record store guy, you can play my band. <laughs> and I was. I was playing with Sid and um, those guys. And, and we were actually, he was... His idea was I'd be kind of singing a few songs, and we were doing a version of That's What You Always Say in that band. But at a certain point, it was like, man, my 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 weird, noisy, psychedelic, um, feedback-laden band is starting to kind of take off, and I can't be in two bands at the same time. So I quit Sid's band politely and, you know, graciously, but he thought I was crazy because Sid was kind of a star in L.A. at the time. And, um, and so I was gone, and my replacement in the band was Stephen McCarthy. So we go... That all the way back to then, and um, have been really close friends ever since. We've we've been through so many records and tours and hanging out and everything together over the years. Oh. And and the, and this record, I mean, I mean, the, I've kind of downplayed the background of the record because I didn't want it to be seen as a um, appendage to the last album or as a side thing or as a or as a as a um, placeholder. But I think by now it's, it's already taking on its own, its own little, um, I don't know, people dig it, I guess I, guess I could say. But it, this, this record was recorded um, during the These Time Sessions two years ago. I'm not sure if you guys know that or if, I t- if I've told you that before. But we were, when we were recording These Times down in, in um, Virginia, Richmond, Virginia, the same studio where I pretty much do everything these days, um, a great place down there called Montrose Recording. Um, we were you know, doing typical 12-hour days, recording day and night, you know, taking dinner breaks, just we're rocking straight through. And at the end of one of our days, um, Steve McCarthy dropped by to have a beer with us, probably 11 o'clock at night, 11.30. And 
you know, we, we were pretty wiped out. But the studio was still open. The engineer and the producer were still hanging out. I said, hey, you know what? Let's take our beers into the studio and just jam for a while. And everyone said, sure, that'll be fun. You know, like, you know, I know we're done for the day, but let's just have some fun. So we went out there, um, the six of us, um, you know, the, the Chris and Jason and Dennis and Mark, me and Steven, and just picked up, you know, our instruments and started playing. This is probably about maybe 12, 30, 1 in the morning when we started. And we just started playing and didn't stop for 80 minutes. We didn't, you know, we just kept going. It was almost like a weird dare. It's like... It, whenever a song would start to dissolve at some point or sort of, you know, feel like it could end, somebody else would start playing a riff and off we went. And we just went and went and went. And, you know, at like 2.30 in the morning, we were done. Said, Holy cow, that was wild. And um, that was that. But, you know, we all left with recordings with um, of what we had done. I listened to that recording of that jam, that 80-minute jam, non-stop for the year that followed. I just loved it so much. I said, this is just, I don't know what it is, but I'm listening to this more than anything, any record I own. I'm just playing this all the time. And I remember um, being, when I was on the promo tour for these times, I was in Europe about, I don't know, I guess now it's two years ago, and I was flying from Paris to Berlin on this promo tour. And um, it was a, pretty much an hour and a half flight, and I listened to the whole thing looking out the window at the plane, you know, a little bit pretty pretty wiped out because, you know, not getting much sleep and in that nice kind of hazy psychedelic state of mind. And I heard it all the way through without doing anything else. And I just started thinking, this has got to come out somehow. Just I don't know how, but it's got to come out. And from that point, I became obsessed with just writing, you know, words to the songs and coming up with melodies and kind of imposing some kind of song structure where there wasn't one. And it was really easy because... Something about the way we played together in this kind of, you know, really natural, um, communicating kind of way where we were actually just in the moment, it had its own flow to it. And so what you hear on the new record, on, on the universe inside, is pretty much what we did. We whittled it down from 80 minutes to 60, um, and but it's all kind of in order. It's just, it's what it was and when just things were added Wow, that's incredible. I, that's, a, that's, a, that's a long-winded but no. still compact story. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. I love now, that. I want to know where those 20 minutes went. <laughs> I want to know where those you 20 know, minutes that got cut went. You're, 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 um, there's one point of the 20 minutes I can describe. There's about half, the, the, like I say, it happened in order. So you, the, um, the two singles are the first two things in the recording of the regulator which is 20 minutes and then the longing which is eight so that's that's you know right away a big chunk of the start after we played what became the longing i remember this very well it's like 30 minutes in um mark walton put down his bass left the room came back in with a bottle of tequila and shot glasses and we were still playing we didn't stop he just you know all of a sudden there's no bass and we're just kind of you know it's almost like um you know you're just I don't know, passing the torch to somebody else, and you don't want the torch to be extinguished. We kept playing, and he walked around the room, handing us each a little shot of tequila, and um, whoever, of course, was, you know, indulging would stop for about 10 seconds, but we kept going. There's about a seven-minute point, and we didn't use it. It's at the start of the third song, the start of um, Apropos of Nothing, you hear a little bit of it, where it's this sort of weird avant-garde section of us sort of keeping, keeping going but making for weird outside free form avant-garde music just to just to keep in place it's, 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 and, and I, I will tell you I know your frequent guest Pat Thomas thinks that's probably the best seven minutes of the record so we'll, we'll have to put that out some other time <laughs> he, he called it music concrete which I think is um, 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 you know kind of a term used for people using whatever pieces and elements to make noise and 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 calling it music which is what we were doing during that little part. So, the, so yeah, maybe someday we'll do the long form of the record. I love that. I love that. And, oh my. It, and it's, yeah. it's very successful. Uh, everybody that that I've talked to that has heard it loves it. Soraya and I love it, of course. So yeah. it, it was Great. very, very successful. 
uh, experiment adventure. I we did want to mention that there's two other people that play on the album, Marcus and Johnny, but we'll get to the, them in a little bit. We wanted to go through the okay. so- songs, um, but before that, I wanted to make note of the producer. So, John Agnello, right? He he yep. he yep. worked with you on these times, so obviously he was there while you were recording. Then the band also uh, is part of the production, and Adrian Olson, is that correct? Exactly. Yep. Yeah. And, and both um, John and Adrian, well, Adrian engineered um, all three of our comeback records, the last three records, and he's he's kind of the studio manager, engineer of the studio of Montrose in, in Richmond, so I, I've, I've worked with him for a long time. He also worked on the last Miracle 3 record, he worked on the last Danny Dusty record, um, quite a lot of stuff I've done. And um, John mixed How Did I Found Myself Here, but he actually tracked these or he produced and and engineered these times and so he um was there when this was all laid down wow but but the thing is and you know so yes the the, the production credit would be john adrian and the dream syndicate um because we were all there you really you know you couldn't the, the songs were written by the six of us the the productions all of us because it just happened it wasn't you know it wasn't formulated it wasn't talked about it wasn't anything but just a moment that was captured which is great um but adrian and i went back last september and spent five days down in richmond to, um sort of with this mass form of you know this this just you know unformed ungroomed piece of music and just went at it playfully um and i know one of the things that's in the the bio for the record was that i, I think i tossed off um, when I was talking to Pat, maybe who Pat, Pat wrote the bio, by the way, for the record, and um, did a great job. And one thing I mentioned was that the, all we added was air, which is true. The, what was added to the record were vocals, backing vocals, percussion, and um, and horns, saxophone, and trumpet. So nothing. All the all the electric music, all the band rocking stuff, is what happened that night. So to to say production means we all got out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is a, I think uh, Jeff and I have had a lot of discussions about this particular release, and this is a really different sounding um, release, and and I think that, uh, I think Pat Thomas called it improv, was it, you know, it's almost like jazz, where it just takes us in a lot of different directions, and so we're definitely sensing that you know okay someone gave us a riff we're gonna ride this out and then move on to something else and then when you look at the division of the record uh, of the album you go okay wait uh what is it one two three four five you know five songs but then when you sit down and listen and really disconnect like uh, like on your flight from paris to berlin where you just kind of let it take you in oh boy time just it, it's like over in a snap it just seems like time is just limitless this yeah. is a it's a really interesting release so side a jeff or side one yeah so side one is one song so the regulator takes up side one mm-hmm. of the so the album's a double album double vinyl right and double so, gatefold old school like a total 70s experience so, so can, can we talk about the song so regulators the first song you mentioned over 20 minutes long um i was noting that uh some of the one of the lines of the lyrics says songs and sounds that soothe the savage soul That's a good description of the album in its entirety. Can you tell us about how you came up with the lyrics for the regulator? Or was there anything behind it? There was a kind of a wild story. It's, 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 I think you know most of the things that happened on this record happened quickly without a lot of forethought. Even not not just the original playing by all of us, but even what happened afterwards. In the old days, I'd walk around town with a pen in my pocket and a notebook 
and you know write down lyrics as they came to me. Now I do it all on my phone, so I'm always typing a line here and a line there into my phone. And I had kind of this one file, just you know, random lines I was thinking might come into play on this new record. And so it kind of was, you know, I would add to it all the time. And I remember it was, it was I was out in Manhattan. I live in Queens, New York. So for those of you who, who don't know New York City geography, it's just across the river from Manhattan. So it's, it's very close, you know, kind of a from, you know, 15, I think 15, 20 minutes on the subway from me. And I was in, in Manhattan hanging out with some friends and doing stuff. And walking around, after, after lunch with my friends, I walked around town, and I kind of got an idea for an approach to the vocal on the song. I said, oh, I know. I want to do kind of a low, kind of spoken, mumbled, grumbled, something between Captain Beefheart and, I don't know if you know, Ken Nordeen, kind of a word poet, um, kind of jazz beat kind of guy. I want to do that kind of approach, and um, yeah, so I want to, so I, I got to hurry on home. I got to get on the subway and get home so I can record this when I get home and, and try it out. So I, you know, got on the rush hour subway, you know, eight stops from Times Square to, to Jackson Heights where I live, got the subway, ran home, turned on the computer, you know, got a recording, simple recording set up at home, and I grabbed, the, you know, the first mic I could find, some cheap mic, and a harmonica, and open my phone to this um, file of random lines, and all I want to do is just get this concept down and record it, so I kind of play with it later on, but like, while well, it was still fresh in my head, I wanted to try it out. So I ran the song, the the, the whole 20-minute thing, harmonica, and, and everything wrong, like, you know, like, like not even worrying about distance from the mic or a, or a, 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 a screen to get... get I did nothing right. I just sat down at the <laughs> microphone... And I looked at the phone, and I just recited the words in random order. Just, you know, kind of like, okay, I've got all this stuff. I've got, you know, have you heard? And I've got, you know, sound, uh, uh, songs and sound to soothe the savage soul. That's nice, you know. And, um, you know, the altar boys dusting out the rust. That's cool. And I would just kind of go back and forth and then blow the harmonica when I just didn't like singing anymore. And said, okay, that should do. And put it down and, you know, when turned off the computer and, a couple of days later, I listened to it and I said, God, that's kind of cool. And once again, just like the initial jam, the more I listened to it, I said, yeah, that's, that's it. That's, that, that's, that's the final vocal. So just kind of, you know, this one, I mean, I don't think, you know, if, you, if you're a band like the Dream Stick is and has always been, that kind of relies a lot on jamming, mm -hmm. the downside of it is when it doesn't work, it's a bummer. You know, when you're on, I mean, I think we do it pretty well and I think, I think, we do it we do it well most of the time, but they're nice when we'll do some jams and you'll think this is going nowhere. <laughs> you'll try something out and think, well, not only is this going nowhere, but we're stuck in the middle of it and we've got no way out. So it's going nowhere and we're going to go nowhere for a long time. And that's you know that's the that's the price you pay if you if you experiment like that. But the upside is when you lock in, when you get something that's cool. Yes, it's the best feeling in the world. You're just flying. It's like oh, you know, and and when it goes like that. You feel like, you know, how did I know to do that? How did how did how did Dennis know at that point to throw in that fill that triggered that riff that Stephen played that make made Mark turn his bass line upside down? How did we we couldn't have even begun to do that if we would have thought about it? And I can I can tell you, and every band knows this when you use you know um, your you know your your logic and reason in the studio and try to really do something that you've mapped out. Half the time it doesn't work, and it drives you nuts because you keep doing it and driving into the ground trying to get it right. And the more you try to get it right, the more mannered and stilted it sounds. Like for example, say as a singer, a lot of times when I when I sing a lyric I've written, I'll sort of approach it from almost like a mathematical thing. Well, the phrasing is this, and it's got to go like that, and you know, and that can trip you up because you forget to, you know, sing a song the way you would if you never heard it before. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, example. I, I love, you know, I, everybody knows I, I like I like the Velvet Underground, and and uh, I love I love the um, the Loaded album with the Velvets. And if you listen to um, Rock and Roll when Lou Reed sings Rock and Roll on, on on Loaded, I don't know if he had never sung that song before or what, but he sings that song like like it just came to him that moment. It's the craziest, most random, weird, loopy, funny unpredictable phrasing and I love that and you it's sometimes hard to do that when you've planned things out 
you don't allow yourself to be that free. So one nice thing about what we did with the new record is everything on there is just in the moment, including these accidental vocals that happened. And you look back at that kind of stuff. Well, actually, just the other day I was, I was watching um, this, that, that Miles Davis documentary that's out right now, um, on Birth of the Cool, which is really good. And I was, I was watching that, and they, um, they get to um, the Miles Davis record, Kind of Blue, which is you know, probably his biggest record, most recognizable, a standard of jazz, a record that, you know, anybody who lists 10 important jazz records, Kind of Blue, would be up there. And they talked about how, and I didn't know this, but they talked about how you know, he had his band, and they got in the studio one night, and, they, and Miles brought in a couple sketchy melodies and just some little riffs, but just let the band go. And that's how, and they played it, and that was it. Kind of Blue is an evening in a studio with Miles saying, here's a couple little things, let's see what happens. But when you hear the Kind of Blue now, it couldn't be any other way. Of course it's got to be that way. Of course everything happens like that because that's how we hear it. So there's, you know, the, it's funny how the things that are unintentional feel more intentional later, and the things that were meant to be intentional seem like, you know, just just uncomfortably wrong later. Yeah, I think that approach definitely gives this new album an energy behind it that, and a flow that's unlike anything that the band has done previously. I would think that that would make it difficult to reproduce in a live setting the way that these songs came together but there's mm. there's just an energy and flow of these songs that are amazing and i'm glad to hear that approach that you took to the singing uh and doing these lyrics because they just it just comes across in a different way um rather than what you would normally hear on an album so i'm glad to hear that approach so the lyrics that you uh on the first chorus you say the altar boys dusting off the the rust and then later calendar boys dusting off the rust it, and dusting off the rust is an album title that comes later so it's almost like there's a long title yeah a, a running theme throughout the mm -hmm. record more or less there are, there's there's some extent i mean that was that was a playful thing i've always actually i've always liked actually, um people who you know do records where the the title of the record comes from a song on a different record or, you know, um, um, or where a song title comes from a different song. I think it's always, always like it. So we had the one, um, the fourth song. Well, you know, it's funny to call them songs because it's just <laughs> one. It really is. You know, even on the regulator, when you hear, um, hear that after 20 minutes, it ends with a little explosion. That was Obviously, we, we, did, we didn't blow anything up. There were no explosions <laughs> in the studio. That was, that, was, that was added artificially just as like kind of a, a whimsical choice. But really, at the end of The Regulator, before you get to the start of the next song, The Longing, there's no break. If you take the explosion out, it just happens in real time. So, you know, we just, we just kind of got to that weird, um, when you hear the song after about 20 minutes, we just kind of are getting louder and more intense and just spinning our wheels faster and faster and then we stopped and we stopped we just went into the next jam um we threw the explosion there for fun so i guess the point i'm making is you know it's weird to be calling them songs but they are they are all different five different sections that somehow have their own vibe even though they weren't played to be different i would say this is i mean i love talking about this record it's it's my favorite thing we've ever done i mean and i know everybody says that when they make a new record but i'm just and i think this is a real indication that everybody in the band, and Stephen included, feels the same way. We're just so excited about this record. And, and you, you rarely, you know, anybody who's in the band can tell you, or anybody who's in any kind of collaborative situation, you can't always make everybody happy. Usually somebody will say, well, I wish I liked as much as you guys, but I'll go along for the sake of the team. We all love this record. Us as well. And then there's a, a three minute and 54 five second edit of the regulator was that made so it was easier to digest or could be played on the radio what was the purpose for the three minute 55 second edit radio radio yeah it was for the radio i mean and and it's the first thing i mean i you know another you know another thing that you know bands don't really get to say but we really love our label we're, we're an extremely cool label anti is the greatest and, and um this is a perfect example I, I had the idea to do the edit of that just because 
they have a great radio department, and we've gotten a lot of, a lot of really good radio play in the last two records. So I thought, well, it's asking a lot for these stations that like us to play a 20-minute song. Maybe, you know, in the early 70s when they were, you know, everyone was pretty wasted and, you know, and <laughs> needed a break to do it. <laughs> It'd be different, than which kind of radio I grew up on. Um, but he asked me, Russell, let's do an edit. And we went to Anti with the edit, and they said, okay, that, that will, yeah, I could see that probably will help with some of the radio play. And I said, now, we're working, and we'll get to this, the video thing later, but we're working on this video to go with the record. Do you want the video for the song to be the the, the 354 minute version? And said, no, 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 we want the full 20 minute version. That's what the song is all about. That's what this record is about. Let's go with the 20 minute version. And I said, all right. <laughs> it's great. And, and, and to their credit, they, I think they've, from the start, from when we started working on this, um, the, um, the people with the label and 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 um, my and our man Andy Culkin, we I, I was kind of talking to him a lot during the whole process of this record. Um, we kind of felt like let's just this time do what we do and be who we are who we are to the extreme, like not even worry about it. This you know this is the kind of record you know I'm gonna say, I'm gonna, as I say that I realize when we started the band, Kendra and Dennis and Carl and I all had the philosophy of we either want to be loved or hated. We want to be, we want to be, if we can be one person's favorite band in the world, that's enough for us. We don't want to be kind of liked by people. We want to either be, you know, somebody go nuts over us or say, I just don't get this at all. And I think this record has returned to that feeling of like, well, if you don't get this kind of thing, we still love you, but you know, come back on the next record. What's really cool is going in with that, with that, with that feeling, with that very, you know, very, sweet, benign, but challenging kind of attitude, so far everyone kind of loves it, so that's great. Yeah. I think that, they, that that's nice. And then the concept for the, the video, where, uh, who came up with it, or, I mean, how did how did that come about? Well, um, it, it, a guy, David Doglish, um, he lives in Scotland, uh, He he's done kind of our last five videos, he did a video, he did, he, um, I first encountered him because he did a video for the band Eyelids, who are a great band out of Portland, and he did a really cool video for them. So I, I wrote to the band's singer, um, I'm Chris, and said, who is this guy who did that video? He said, some guy in Scotland. I've never met him face-to-face. He's just a fan, and he did it as a labor of love. It's not his, not his day job. He just does it, you know, for, for fun. So I wrote to David, Dogwish in Scotland. I said, hey, I'm friends with Chris from Eyelids, and... And um, we won a video for this song, um, Steve's Dream, which was the alternate version of Kendra's Dream on the first record that we put on the on the EP that followed the record. And he said, great, I'd love to do that. And he did the video for that, which was fantastic. It was great. I said, oh, man. I said, you know, I remember at the time I said, wow, what a great job. What can we give you for that? He said, oh, a signed copy of the record will be fine. So that, that was, you know, that was great. But and, and then we did, we did put out these times. Um, he did four videos for that record because he just, you know, was so good and kind of. We it's it's funny. We I think with this this go round of the dream sync with the 21st century dream sync or whatever, we've kind of locked into really good visual people, good mm-hmm. good cover designers, good cover artists, good photographers, good um, video makers, and the the visual side of what we do has been just not due to anything we've done ourselves, just by finding really good people has been fantastic so david did the four videos for the last record for um those put some miles on black light and the way in and um, bullet holes Mm -hmm. and we still hadn't met him he'd done five videos for us we had not met him ever we never spoke to him just communicated by email and i think uh, i "I want to meet this guy we played berlin last um october for the, for the last record we, we played in Berlin, and um, he flew from Scotland to Berlin to see the show and hang out with us. And he's a great guy. He was like really just, you know, hyper energetic and uber fan. He showed up at the gig with you know, a bag full of 20 vinyl records he just bought down the street, and he's just, you know, the excited guy. And, um, and we, at that point, this record was all mixed and all that. And, you know, I was thinking, God, I'd love for him to do a video for this record, but how are you going to make a video for a 16 minute record? 
And I'm kind of thinking sheepishly, I'm like, I don't want to bug him with that. It's, it's, it's not even his day job. I don't want to bug him with a 60-minute video and make him feel obligated. Fortunately, Mark Walden doesn't worry about stuff like that. <laughs> he's, <laughs> he's not shy at all. And Mark walked up to him and said, okay, here's what's going on. We've got this record. It's 60 minutes long. You should do a video for the whole record. And he said, that's great. I'd love to. Wow. So thank, thankfully, Mark is more more bold than I am sometimes. Wow. Um, some, all the time, actually. <laughs> and um, so that, that was it was all hash. And, and David said, yeah, I'm going to do a 60-minute video for the record. And he is now been doing that he did the 20 minute video for the for regulator now i will say the way david works and you can probably tell from looking at it but almost everything he's done is from found footage that he has i mean i think i think he shoots stuff he travels a lot so i know he shoots stuff when he travels so some things might be his his own documentation but he just finds stuff all over the place i don't know where it comes from i don't know if he has the rights to it i don't know if we could be sued at some point i'm not worried about that because i don't think you know people are I don't, I don't think that's first and foremost on people's minds in the legal world, but but he um he did um he puts these together and I don't know how he does it, but he does it. So we're still waiting for the last thirty minutes, and that'll be coming soon. <laughs> so speaking of the next video, that leads us yeah. into side two of the vinyl record, which begins with the longing. So the longing. that video was right. just released. <laughs> So same same person, right? It sounds like did the video. Yeah, everything. I mean, eventually you'll see all of them from the record. They'll come out one by one, I'm sure. But this one's out, just came out, and it's it's you know it's funny because even though same guy with the same process, and it's just the next eight minutes in the jam that follow the regular, it has a whole different vibe. It's like a completely different mood. I mean, you would really think. I think anyway, you would you would think that it was just a different recording, a different day, a different you know. Okay, now well, we did that freaky, free jazz, kraut rock, psychedelic, epic thing. Now let's chill out and play a different kind of song. But that was just what happened next. Nice. So can and that, you... that I just wanted to add that song, "The Longing," um, or that section of this jam, "The Longing," is the one that's been kind of coloring the last. I don't know five or six days for me and this one part this one part i can't i can't disconnect from and so i'm just curious about the inspiration to uh where that came from to write the lyrics and it's the harder you try to fix it eliminate deep six it all that's left is the longing the harder you try to fix it You know, it's just, oh, I don't know. It was a, it was something that kind of colored my week mm-hmm. last week and bleeding into this week, you know, because um, so many things are just happening so fast. And the minute you think you've got a solution, you got to backtrack and kind of just leave it. But then you're just kind of left with this, I don't know, this sense of uh, melancholy and nostalgia of like, well, I thought this was gonna kind of gonna go this way. Well, it's going this way now, so let's just embrace it. But you know, you still have that link to it. Where yeah. where did the inspiration for these lyrics come from? Well, I, I love everything you just, I love everything you just said. That's beautiful and it's really true. And I have to say, when I saw when I saw the video, which I, um, I think was just last week, middle of last week, it was when all this was starting to really kind of happened when all you know when really was looking oh we're this is getting serious and i just would move to tears i just kind of you know i broke down when i saw the video because it was so it felt so now it felt so at the moment you know 
um, and the song too, I guess. But the video was just like, oh my god, this this is breaking my heart. And um, yeah, you know, you, you you think you know where it's at, but the longing is stronger than that. You know, you, it, it, and that the song is about, you know, when you think you have control over a situation, and something more powerful, more emotionally devastating, throws you off your game in a big way. And um, you know, um, that's yeah. It, it was the idea, of the lyric, and it kind of the idea, of, you know, where we're at now. It's like you know, this that sort of uncertainty, sleepless for days and days, decisions and communiques, you know, sleepless, unsettled, and alone. You know, it's like, oh yeah, right, right, where we're at. Um, so yeah, it's 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 it, it's kind of an unintentional and unfortunate soundtrack for this moment. Right. The words what came from an um, uh, old friend of mine um, in, out in L.A. who just, I think, I, she's probably forgotten this. And I've talked about this a few times now, and I'm, I have to actually tell her I'm referring to her her nameless story. But but she, she said, you want to write a song called The Longing? Because that is such a fundamental, primal human emotion. I went, wow, she's right. That is really the kind of, just kind of a... You know, whether it's romantic or familial or or nostalgic, it is kind of the thing that just rips you up when you're just longing, aching for something. And that stuck around me for a long time. This is years ago, three or four or five years ago. And I guess when I heard that piece of music, I said, oh, yeah, that's that's going to be the longing. And the word just came really easily. Great tune. Great tune. It's very, uh, yeah, and very apropos. Very apropos. Okay. And the process of doing the longing was like kind of the way the whole record is, you know, it's kind of, it's, and I'd, I'd done this before with the Dream Sting with them, um, um, on the last record, on, on, on Whole World's Watching, on, on These Times, which is also um, a jam. That one is, that one, mm-hmm. that one on the last record is kind of the precursor to this record in a way because that was, it was recorded the same way we did this. I mean, something I haven't talked about yet in this interview with you guys is when we did These Times, we kind of spent about an hour each day just jamming. We thought, let's, let's, you know, nothing, nothing too. That's not, you know, earth shattering with balance the dream syndicate. But we, we would do that kind of thing. Well, maybe we'll find a song in one of these jams. And we did. We had a couple that didn't come out, and one that did come out was the whole world's watching, which is, you know, it's kind of us doing our thing to to the same drum machine you hear on the regulator. This old thing called a. Um, it's, it's a seventy early seventies drum machine called the Maestro Rhythm King. I love it. I love it because. <laughs> I'm one of my favorite albums of all time. Often my favorite is um, Sly, and Fa- Sly and the Family Stone. There's a ride going on. And that whole record uses this drum machine. So I've always loved it. And I bought it on eBay about 20 years ago. And um, I know <laughs> it's just sat and collected dust all this time. I know Linda would say, are you ever going to use that thing? I said, yeah, yeah, I got it. it's great. I'm going to, I got to use that someday, but it, it, I can't get rid of it. Cause I really, it's, it's pretty and it's sitting up there. And well, it's kind of, it's the sound of, um, the regulator and whole world's watching, but in, in what I was getting to is with a lot writing lyrics for these songs, like the new album and like that whole world's watching, um, is I would just listen to what the band was saying and think, well, what indicates where I start singing? Oh yeah, um, on the longing, Chris Kakovis is playing this beautiful little melody um, that he kind of repeats, do 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 do. Um, Chris is great at he's he's great at hooks. He, he does stuff like that all the time. And so I figured, well, that must be the the riff. And when he stopped playing the riff, I guess that's where I start singing. And Dennis does a drum fill at some point three minutes into the song. I think, okay, he did that drum fill, so I guess when I stopped singing. And, you know, and, and something ha- each, each time something would happen, it would indicate where a chorus might be or where, where a, uh-huh. you know, where a refrain might be. Or, or, you know, on that one, the song disintegrates after about four minutes, so that's where I'll stop singing. And that was kind of the approach to a lot of this record. I just took clues as a singer from what the band was doing. So even it was fun. It's a fun way to work. It's like it's like being Columbo, like showing up on a on a crime <laughs> scene and trying to figure out what happened. <laughs> nice. Musical Columbo. I like it. <laughs> yeah, that's great. So apropos of nothing, the the next song, the second song on side two, the side two being the only side with two different pieces on it. I got to tell you, Steve, right now, currently, this is my favorite ten minutes of the entire 60 minute record i'm just, i've fallen in love with cool. ap- apropos of nothing and i was curious about where you sing what were you expecting what did you recall apropos of nothing chain reaction before the fall what were you- What 
What was your yeah. thought behind that? Well, I jump straight to is, political. That's what where my mind goes. Well, that's fair enough. Uh, and I'll go. I'll go along with that because I had no idea. It was again in keeping with this whole record. Um, when I went back to Richmond with Adrian Olson um, last September to work on it, we were listening to that song, and Stephen McCarthy had come down to do some play some pedal steel on that and do a couple other things. And I thought, well, you know, I should just put a vocal on this just to see if maybe, you know, if it needs it, if, if a vocal could work here. So I went out to the, to the studio, picked up a notebook, and wrote the words in about 10 minutes. So I just kind of wrote anything, whatever came to mind, just, just kind of something I could sing. You know, like the same, same thing again. It's like, you know, what was, you know, obviously I'd been listening to the song for, at that point, for probably an hour while Stephen worked on it. So it was kind of fresh in my head and I was excited about it. So those words just came out fast. There are actually, I think, twice as many verses as there are on the song. I just kind of wrote frantically and then sang it. And so, then sang it again as a harmony, and that was that. So i got to say, any interpretation you put on it is probably right. It's <laughs> probably more right than what I would say. <laughs> but, that, but that was fun. I mean, that, that's really like, you know, again, it's just jamming. It's like, you know, it's kind of the spirit of, um, if I if I would have had, you know, and now it's not true for every song because I can say, you know, we'll, we'll be coming up later to talk about the slowest rendition. And those lyrics I agonized over for weeks and weeks. So it's all different. But on, on Apropos of Nothing, those words were written fast and sung fast. First take writing, first take singing. Wow. Probably no time at all. Wow. Wow. See, and I, I love the last four lines. You know, and I know, the bells are told <laughs> are just Pavlovian entropy. Orientation is so overrated. My sideways reversible calligraphy. I love those four lines. Yes, yes. <laughs> I'm like, wait, this, uh, this was a first take? Oh, man. You know and I know the bells at Psychedelic, but it makes sense. It's, it's, it sounds more like you know, like like you know, like some type of garage psychedelia record we might have all been listening to, very paisley, you know, very very. You know, sure. would love, you know, um, but it, it but it makes sense. It does, yeah. you know, it does. It absolutely does. And we didn't even mention the first couple lines. You're talking about psychedelia, ballerina, sunset against the sky, <laughs> crimson tinted Sunday slide. Amazing, amazing words. Just sounds like stream of con- consciousness from what you're telling us. Yeah. And, yeah. It's they're great. They're great. So Thank you. side three, we talked about the phrase earlier, dusting off the rust, and it's an instrumental. This is probably my second favorite ten minutes of this record right now. And I if you wouldn't mind, Steve, I wanted to take this opportunity since we're talking about this instrumental piece. Can you tell us about the horn player, Marcus Tenney? Yeah, I'd love to. Um He's, he's he's amazing, and and um, when I went down to work on the the second phase of the record, um, I let Adrian. You know, again, Adrian lives in Richmond. He, that's where the studio is. So I said, I think we might want to put some, maybe some sax or trumpet. I don't know. I feel like someone's record could have some horns on it, but I'm not sure where. I, I think I was thinking on the on what became the regulator to start with, and he said, oh, I know a guy down here. He's great. He plays in a kind of a a jazz funk, weird kind of hybrid sort of thing, you know, that band down here, and he's really fast and has good ideas. It's like, great, we'll have him come down. So he got in touch with him. I think he heard, yeah, he, I think he was given the 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 rough mixes of what we were doing. But he came in while I was down there with the idea that, you know, he would play on this one track, and I, um, on the regulator, there's there's a the vocal line that Stephen does, like da 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 da. It becomes like a repeating thing on there that I had written on piano and Stephen sang. So I said, well, you can pick up on that. So he did, and then just kind of went off soloing. And I mean, when you hear that track, the soloing on the regulator is insane. It's like you know, I don't even have to compare it to because it's kind of you know it's, it's it's jazz on one hand, but it reminds me of stuff like traffic on John Barleycorn must die or this kind of thing. I don't know. It just was, you know, it, it actually, after he played, I was like, where, where is this coming from? Like, what are you into? We talked about music for a couple of hours and he, I thought he was picking up on some wild prog stuff from the seventies, but he didn't, he wasn't too knowledgeable about that. He's like, he's a jazz guy. 
anyway, really cool guy, and he um, if you get, and his band's called Butcher Brown, and um, you know you if you check him out online, there you know, there you can see how the flavor of what he does there he brought to the record. But once he played on regular, I said, man, you got some time, you want to keep playing, and he just played on everything because he was so good. So he you know he I think he's on every song except I have a pro of nothing. He's only on four of the five songs. And he just, he, once again, the beauty of the first take, the only instruction I gave him when he went to play is just, just play like you're playing with the band. You know, which, you know, which, is, which of course I'm sure he thought, yeah, of course, that's what I do. <laughs> but I felt like, just, you know, just, just, you know that's all, just play, play along with the band. And he did it so well and so fast and so intuitively. And really, I got to say, you know, shaped the record. It's like, you know, he really... You know, every you know, the flavor of what we all do, what all what all the members of the band do, is you can feel it. It's heard. There's no invisible member. Everybody brought their their thing to the record, and it's all there. But I gotta say, what Marcus did on horns made it a whole different thing. It just you know, it's it's it became the flavor of the record. So I was just fortunate. He's he's fantastic, and um, and so on. Apropos, I mean, on on dusting off the rust, that one I kind of knew from the start. I didn't want to sing on that part. It just felt like its own kind of, I don't know. It's this cool, almost, you know, dancey, clubby type groove going on. And I said, you know, the horns are going to be the lead singer. Just go out there and do your thing. And, and that one, that was the one where he, the only one where he didn't do it the day I was there. He did it later on this over when I wasn't in town. We did it with Adrian. And I had written out a whole, like, you know, melody. I said, well, here's kind of an idea so you can play there on the song. And, this melody I came up with on my, you know, my piano. So check it out. And he very politely said, well, "I've got some ideas of my own. So, all right, <laughs> go ahead." And they were great, and much better than mine. <laughs> That's hilarious. Mark Walton starts it's, it's that. Cool. It's cool. I, mean, I, I like that one a lot. I really like yeah. that. You know, I'm, I'm, it's I'm, great. It it's... works as an instrumental. I think it's just it's, it, it yeah. you know it um did didn't need me rambling on about anything on that one <laughs> it starts off with mark doing this the monster bass lick that mm -hmm. I, I just love it and this monster yeah And the sound that Chris gets on his organ, that that sound I just really love. He's really tasteful about picking sounds that really work for the songs that he's a part of. I will definitely he's say that. He's great that way, yeah. yeah. He's I mean, again, like I say, everybody, I can see all the best elements, well, with nothing but best elements. I, I love my bandmates, but I can really hear the things everybody brought to it, you know, and, and, and Dennis and Mark groove together so well, and Mark just has these, you know, just, just really melodic, but just insistent grooves, and he loves playing the same thing for an hour. He's happy to do that, which for somebody as good player as he is who can play anything, the fact that he's so selfless in search of the groove is amazing. Um, Jason has so much skill, not just for technical guitar ability, which is he's off the charts as far as that, but also soundscaping and making, you know, just things, just building sounds where you don't know how he did it and where they're coming from, but they're, they just, you know, shape, they take it out of the normal, you know, like my, I'll admit as a guitarist, my approach is plug in a fuzz box, plug it into an amp and off you go. <laughs> um, Jason will, Jason does a lot more, puts a lot more thought into what the sound is going to be, and you feel that there. Chris, like you mentioned, is um, not only, you know, as a, again, as a, like Jason, as a great musician, he can just sit at a piano and play incredible things, but he looks for weird sounds and weird melodic things that fit into that sound and um, that become instant hooks. I think, you know, Chris just has a really good knack for finding a hook that becomes the indelible thing you go back to over and over again on a song. So, um, yeah, and on, and on that song, he definitely does. But, the, but you were singing on Mark's groove, I have to say, this is a perfect example. When we finished what became Apropos of Nothing, when you hear the end of that, we're finally just, you know, for those who haven't heard, and 
most of your listeners won't hear it for a couple of weeks. But at the end, it just gets faster and wilder to a point where you're almost like on a tilt a whirl about to lose your mind, you know, and, and it gets just wilder and more intense and finally just collapses. Um, and when it collapses, that could have been the end. You, when you hear what, you know, what happens right there and when you hear certain things that, that I'm playing and that Chris is playing, that Jason's doing, you can tell if you kind of, you'd be right as well. When you, you if you listen to it, you could imagine that we're all saying, okay, man, it's two in the morning, we're fried, we're done, we did what we came to do, and then Mark, start, Mark starts playing that bass line. <laughs> and that's really what happened. Like, we were done. <laughs> we were really done. We, we, we made our point. We played at that point for, what, 45 minutes, 50 minutes. But Mark started playing that line, went, all right, here we go. <laughs> and off we, went, off we went. Sounds like he re-energized the band. Yeah. He did. He did. <laughs> So you mentioned a lot of pieces and parts to this particular song. There's something that I really love about Dusting Off the Rust, and it's the industrial metallic percussion. Yeah. Whose idea was that? That's Johnny Hot. Johnny Hot of Gutterball and the House of Freaks, who lives in Richmond, who's a, uh, also a great, really great longtime friend of mine, and we toured together and hung out you know, um, he had mentioned to Steve, and he said, I'd love to come down, you know, play a little bit. I said, great, be fantastic. So he came down, and, you know, I, I, I think I had the idea he would play on that one, not on, he plays on that and apropos of nothing. But yeah, I thought, okay, come down, bring it, you know. Mo- most people in that situation would come down with a tambourine or, you know, whatever. He showed up with... Um, some cattle horn that his grandfather had, something called a bass triangle, which is a triangle the size of a guitar. Wow. Um, I mean, he shows up weird stuff. That's kind of like, and some weird electric, one thing you mentioned, this electric percussion thing, which I don't even, it looked like some, you know, something that was made in 1978 during the disco um, era that just looked tacky and weird and funky and cheap. He says he's banged on that for a while. So he really found unusual stuff and, um, the only kind of traditional thing he uses on that song as well as bongos, which he played this super fast, I don't know if you'd say double time or quadruple time pattern for 10 minutes straight, which I thought his hands were going to bleed was incredible. So yeah, he had, a, he had a quite a bit to do with the percussion on those two songs. Very nice. Yeah, I really, really like that that metallic percussion in there. It's it It just makes, it just gives it a great feel to it. It adds a, another dimension yeah. to that song. I really love that. And it's weird. It's like there's a lot of weird things here. And when you mentioned earlier about playing it live, which is, um, you know, that's a whole other thing, which we'll have to figure out, you know, well, given where we're at right now, when that could even happen anyway, um, which is a whole different story, obviously. But also, um, you know, I to be honest, there are a lot of things on this record where Stephen... And Jason and Chris and I, the four kind of, I guess, melodic instruments in the records, we don't know who's doing what. I can hear something, I think, I think that's me, but it might be Chris, but I'm not sure. And there's a lot of that on there. We'll have to kind of dig through the whole thing later on and figure out how to recreate it. And we really have decided that when we play it live, we want to play it live. Like we're, Even at the jam, we don't want to just go on stage and use that as a springboard for more jamming. We're so happy with the way it became... A sculpted thing, a, a, a very intentional sounding thing. We want to learn the record and do it live sometime. Yeah, yeah. you're telling me. <laughs> we, <laughs> luckily, we have, luckily we have time on our hands now. <laughs> and then we get to the slowest rendition. Yeah. Now, you said the lyrics you agonized over for weeks. Uh, was it just that the, they weren't coming as fast and furious as before, or was it how how the song was progressing, how the music was progressing and trying to find the the lyrics to go with it? Well, you're right. One, one thing was because it's such, especially the first five minutes of it, um, it's so random and almost kind of, you know, broken. It was hard to find where the vocal would go, and I kind of mm-hmm. figured that out. You know, it, it doesn't... It, there's no real time kept. It's kind of this floating out there thing until halfway through it kicks in. 
So that was a little challenging. But the the main thing was, and I and I wasn't sure if I was going to talk about this, but I got um, encouragement and permission for this. The song is about um, my friend and bandmate Scott McCoy. Um, he had a stroke. Uh, I guess it's three years ago now, two years ago. God, I think it's. Actually, I, um, I think, but but he had a stroke on when he was on tour with um, Alejandro Escobedo and Peter Buck and Linda. Um, they were all out on tour, and probably a lot of your listeners know this. He he had a stroke, and it was a very serious one. And he's um, you know, he really you know the, the, what has been documented was really bad. And he's done a good job recovering, and he's doing he's he's out there rocking and making records now. But I I wrote the lyrics back then, probably a little bit while we were still working on these times, because I thought maybe I could use that somehow for that record. And I just wanted to write something about imagining what he was going through. Mm -hmm. Um, Because he was, I was getting reports of his initial recovery from Linda who was out with him and from out there with him and with Peter. And I would hear things about how he was trying to basically get back his mind as one does after stroke. He had to kind of rebuild the mind. He had to kind of hear, and Scott is a really smart guy who can write my, my little, you know, semi boasting about writing those, those lyrics really fast. He does that all the time. He just cranks out lyrics like nobody's business. He's an, he's a prolific, smart, wordy. Every song has 10 different meanings at the same time. Brilliant songwriter. And to think of Scott having to, rebuild that brilliant mind was heartbreaking, which is floored me. I was, I was so sad and, and disturbed by the idea. Well, we all were, all, all his friends and family were. Words and thoughts that once were my stock and trade are strewn about like broken toys mislaid. Melodies and remedies and kindly advice. Put them where I'll find them when the time is right. And so I wrote that song in the middle of all that, just thinking, well, what? What's he going through? What's you know? And that's a that's a presumptuous thing to try to put yourself in that position and try to get the tone right and try to make it empathetic but not maudlin and make it you know make it you know putting yourself in that place. Mm-hmm. So I really labored over what I wanted to say and how I wanted to say it. And to be honest, I didn't think I would ever tell anybody what the song was about, but I, I asked Scott, and he said, yeah. I, he said, I'm, I, I love it. I'm, I'm honored to talk about it. So I, so I feel good talking about it. But that, that's what the whole song is about, lyrically. Mm-hmm. is about Scott's kind of, you know, knowing who he is. I mean, who knows? He, I've, talked to him, I've talked to him a lot since then. We've hung out together and toured together since then. And, I've, you know, you can talk about, well, what were you thinking? You know, and he, he kind of has... You know, he's talked to me a little bit about it, and not, and, but you, know, you imagine you're still you, and what was going on inside your mind while you were remembering to put these things together? So it, it was very, you know, emotional for all of us, for for him, for every, you know, for people who all people who love him and play with him and fans of his music. But I said, well, I'm going to write a song about it, which is, you know, it's biting off a lot. Well, I, I mean, this is a really deep song, and now this puts the context in the right place for me. I mean, because like this really struck a chord in me and it's um, these four lines, words and thoughts that once were my stock in trade are strewn about like broken toys, mislaid melodies and remedies and kindly advice. I put them where I'll find them when the time is right. And I, I lingered over those four lines for a long time trying to decipher it but now now I understand it in its context in its proper context I mean this is a very very powerful song yeah these these lyrics are very powerful and now you can see the context of the whole thing into the museum what you just read like that that's it you know that's you know that's that's what what was happening so yeah and the and the music suggested that because the music is really just it's so (laughs) You know what? What we did initially during the initial late night jam, kind of what you hear there. I mean, it's basically, you know, it's very broken. Bear in mind, this is 60, 70 minutes into the jam. We've been playing after a twelve-hour day in the studio, after you know taking a break, after 
greeting our friend and and grabbing a beer and going back out there and this is now 70 more minutes into that probably like i say two in the morning later i don't know and we're kind of just spent you know we're just at this point we're still playing it's like um you know, like some dare to each other. Like, like first one to stop is like, you know, is, 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 you know first one to stop makes breakfast tomorrow. First, first one to quick pick up the trash tomorrow. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I will point out something I've, I think I've talked about before. The studio where we make these records, um, we, we made the last three records. The whole band lives just 10 feet away from the studio. There's a nice house there. And so we all, we all stay in the same house. We, we take turns cooking. We hang out together. So we're really like a family during that time. So there, that also meant no one had to worry about driving home or going back to you know to feed the dog or this or that. It's like you know we knew we'd play until we went to bed. Mm-hmm. So we were at this point. Yeah, you know, I can hear in the song. We're just kind of you know. Um, there's that movie. Um, they shoot horses, don't they? Where the, the marathon dancers, you know. And it's a little bit of that kind of thing. Where it's like we're gonna keep standing until we drop. And you, I can hear just the the, the the misfires, the sputtering of us all, just trying to hang in there. And then accentuated by Marcus Tenney playing this great stuff on sax and trumpet in the mood of what we're doing, but you just feel this just, you know, it's like a broken car coming to a, a stop and then kind of getting one last head of steam and then we're done. <laughs> nice. And the lyrics, the lyrics fit, the lyrics fit that kind of just defiance, but also just like, like running on fumes kind of feeling of what the jam was. It's a beautiful way to end the record in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. You know what's funny? What's fu- what's funny about it actually is I had all the the pieces when we when we did the recording. And like like, like not, not, not I've kind of talked about what happened, what we were doing in the control room. Um, John and Yellow was there with Adrian Olson and with um, this guy named Tyler, who's in a band called The Head and the Heart, who's a friend of records there a lot, friend of Adrian's, popular band, and they were three. They were in there um, also indulging in their own ways without you know calling them out on but they were all they were they were enjoying themselves as well in there and but you know capturing it and just tripping and just tripping on what we were doing i mean to be honest while we were playing i thought man those guys probably are gone by now they probably just pushed record and left <laughs> they were hanging out kind of taking it all in tripping out with us nice. and um john and john woke up the next morning before we got started in the studio and divided the record into different songs so he was the one who did that that was you know, besides just capturing it, that was a big contribution to the record. Where he, we just said it's a jam, and he kind of made songs out of it. He's that's where he, where he felt this ended and that ended, which is kind of what we kept as the the breaks for the songs. And um, he put those. I guess there were I think six of them, because there was the the seven minute thing that Pat likes. Um, and me too, but um, he put them all in different files. I had them on my phone in random order, and I didn't even know for the longest time which was the first and last thing. I knew the first one, but I kind of didn't know where to end it. So I, at one point, I kind of had to piece it together just by knowing, well, the end of this one has the keyboard that does that little thing, and oh, this one starts with that. So that's, that's, it was you know, like a, a very simple jigsaw puzzle. And so I didn't really always know what the ending was, but now when I hear the slowest rendition, like yeah, you can hear it at the end. That is it. We're just we're done. <laughs> we're, we're, we will we will all be we will all be asleep in three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and I think we were. <laughs> yeah, and it gives it a good vibe. It's not. I wouldn't say it's a, a sleepy song by any means, but it gives it a, a very special vibe, which totally ties into the theme of what the lyrics say in it. So. Good job, Dan. It, it's it, it's amazing. Yeah, thank you. So one last, thank you. we have. There's a couple more things that before we let you go, if, if you don't mind, you mentioned earlier about the visuals. Can we talk a little bit about the cover art that Alex did? I'd love to. I'd love to talk about it. Yeah. By the time we were finishing the record, um, yeah, I, I do a little bit of painting, you know, for my own amusement. I've always done things here and there, just, just and I've been fortunate enough to be shown in this gallery in Austin called Yard Dog, um, uh, Yard, Yard Dog um, Studios down there. And I've, they've done a few exhibitions of my stuff. And on the last thing I did for them, I did a lot of black light paintings. I just kind of, I think because at the time I was working on the song Black Light and I just kind of, I like, I love, I've got to, if, if somebody of my age, I have a real fondness for 
early 70s and black light rooms and head shops and things like that. And, you know, like I, I have nostalgia for that. So I liked it anyway. And, and the guy from the studio in Austin, from the, from the gallery in Austin, sent me an email right around the time we were mixing the record and said, I read an article about this guy. you got to check this out. I think you'll dig it. And so he sent me an article in, um, um, I think in, in, in um, Wired magazine, that, that cool kind of art. Right, right, yeah. That magazine. So he sent me an article from there about this guy. I went, oh, my God, I love this guy's stuff. This is great. And it talked about he was this Ukrainian immigrant in his, in his mid-20s who had kind of who was sick in his youth and had these visions and his visions became his art and he paints in his basement and does these black light things. And, you know, I was just digging all this stuff I was looking at. So I went on his website and I went on his website and it said, it said, I live in Bushwick, Brooklyn, and I will, I give tours of my studio. I went, Whoa, I live in Queens, just like a half hour away. I'm going to go there. So I, so I got in touch and I went to a studio and this guy's a trip. I mean, he's, you know, he'll say, he, he hasn't been in the States that long. He's from, from, um, not from Kiev, but somewhere near Kiev on the Ukraine, came here and just, he has a, you know, apartment in Brooklyn where he, with his with basement, where he goes in there probably 12 hours a day with the black light cranking and just paints these, you know, these things down there with these, you know, with these intensive goggles on because I, I guess it could really hurt your eyes to look at that that long. Anyway, I, I looked at what he was doing. I said, oh my God. I said, I just knew right away that that's the album cover. That's like, this has got to be on the cover. Wow. And I I asked him, I said, have you ever done, like, album art? He said, no, but I really wanted to. I said, well, let's do it. And so it was in the same, in that same spirit of everything just happening quickly without a lot of forethought. I mean, you know, everybody who, well, anybody who does anything creative or anything at all, for that matter, knows that sometimes you just circle around and belabor something and look at a hundred different choices and can't, you're so exhausted by options that you can't even think straight anymore. And that thing... Everything on this record just happened immediately and was right. There wasn't any of that this time on, on this, which is, I would say it's a pretty good sign. You know, I mean, I mean, I, I there are times where you, you where I've made records where there was a lot of labor and the labor was worth it. But generally, my favorite ones are things where it just fell into place. It's just more satisfying, and everything on this record fell into place, including the artwork. And he's, you know, I reckon, in fact, anybody who wants to see more of his stuff, he's on Instagram under his own name, Alex Aliume. Um, and he's got a lot of followers. I guess he's got a pretty he's pretty popular. But his stuff on Instagram is wild, just great. Yeah, he has a website too. If anybody wants to go there, it's www.aliumeart.com. So it's a l i u m e a r t dot com. I recommend you check that out too. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I think your listeners have an appreciation of things that are psychedelic and trippy. Yes. So you know, if you already are prone to that, like I am, for sure. You'll dig his stuff. It's great. It feeds into into this album perfectly. And, you know, we've got one last question for you, Steve. Um, one of the things that we found really, really interesting, um, especially knowing that um, this week the, the video and release of Belonging is coming up, um, was this playlist that you curated. Uh, 10, you gave us, uh, you gave your fans 10 songs that informed or influenced the universe inside. Talk to us a little bit about that. It was really, really interesting and fun to listen to, to hear what those influences were. Uh, what made you think of a, a playlist? It was fun to make. Um, that was Linda's idea. She, she, I mean, she's, you know, for, for better or for worse, hears me rambling on about favorite records and things that, you know, that I'm discussing. But as, as Sheeta, she's obviously a music fan as well. So we, you know, I'll go off on like, oh, man, you know, this is all I want to hear. This is my obsession right now. And she said, well, yeah, kind of share the, the the kind of building blocks of the record and with with, with people. So I thought, yeah, that'd be great, you know. And, and because this record is, you know, there's this, there, there is a certain kind of thing to this record that, all the members of the band really love. You know, I think, you know, our tastes are pretty close, but we each have our own things we like more than the other. But definitely all the members of the Dream Syndicate kind of unite on digging things that are long and jammy and trippy and, you know, <laughs> bench, it's, prog rock is a dirty word, or maybe not, I think, I think not anymore. I think people kind of come around to it, but things are kind of proggy and psychedelic. And I, so I thought, well, let's collect some of the, 
things to put this record in context and maybe show what we were trying to do. Mm-hmm. Um, well, strangely enough, the, the, the things in this playlist, um, you know, like Can and, um, and Soft Machine and um, Kamasi Washington and Miles Davis and um, um, the Birds from the Notorious Bird Brothers record and things like that, are probably the same things I would have played for you, okay, not Kamasi Washington because that's new, but a lot of things are the same things I would have played for you in 1982 when we were coming up with the idea of what we, the dream singer would be even then. In fact, I, I wrote to Kendra the other day, and I sent her um, a, a link to the record. I said, well, we finally kind of circled back to what we started in that basement in 1982. And it, it, this record feels that way, you know. You know, and, and well, you know, when we started, we were, you know, things like, I'm trying to think of all things in the playlist, but things like Can and Roxy Music and, um, and, 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 and Miles and, 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 and Fela Cootie and things like that were things we would have dug back then and said, yeah, that's what we want to do. But what they all have in common is just music that, that, that just takes its sweet time getting where it's going, trips out, uses repetition, which has always been a really big thing of what we do anyway. And um, so it, w- it was nice to just put that together to kind of give a context of what we're doing. That was really fun. And it was really interesting yeah. to see David Bowie's Lazarus show up on that list. Yeah. Oh, yeah, right. That was one of the newer things. Yeah, I mean, when I, mean, when I hear the, the slowest rendition, you know, I, I, it really reminds me, you know, probably unintentionally, I don't know, because I, I, um, I know um, Jay, well, you know, obviously we were all devastated when, 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 when Bowie died and shocked by because you know, we didn't know. And I remember the weekend that Black Star came out. It came out on a Friday and he died on Sunday. And, um, and I remember I, I, I downloaded the record. I bought and downloaded the record on Friday immediately, which I don't always do with his records or with a lot of people. I hadn't been that hip to his recent records. For some reason I did, and I just was obsessed with that record and played it over and over again. I must have played it like 15 times that weekend. Just got into it so much. And then he died that Sunday, and I was like, am I dreaming this? This is so it's freaking me out. It was so, because that record is so haunting, as we know now, he was kind of writing his own eulogy in a way he was writing he was he was making his 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 impending death into an art thing which is oh, so intense and so haunting and so that record was really you know but at this about a week later after he died i remember talking to jason saying you've got to hear this record and he said i can't listen to that record it's too it's too painful to even to, to listen to i can't do it. i'm too broken up and i remember like the next year i say did you listen yet? He said, no, I still can't listen to it. It's like, Jason, you got, you got, it's a great record. I think by now he's gotten into it, but I say this as a point, like what became the slowest rendition feels like that kind of vibe, especially once Marcus had all the horns that may have feel like that. But I'm not sure if the, you know, when I say this is what we were channeling, you could talk to the other guys and they'd say, nah, not at all. <laughs> right, right, right. I was, yeah. I was doing something else entirely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but it definitely put put it into context. I mean, even things with like Sly and the Family Stone with Brave and Strong, and even mm-hmm. Talking Heads, Born Under Punches, came yeah. up on the list yeah. too. So you got all kinds of things that that you thought of in putting this together. Well, the Talking the Talking Heads thing and the Miles thing in particular, those records were made the same way we did our thing, which was you know um, probably few, few, definitely those two for sure. Um, remain in light and um, all those miles records in the early 70s um, on the corner and all those records where the band just played and then later on somebody had to make sense of it you know and and in the case of Talking Heads it was I assume David Byrne and Brian Eno saying okay where's the song and in the case of Miles Davis his producer Tio Macero chopped things up and said okay this is what what it is now so you know that it's funny because we hadn't ever done that kind of thing to you know, maybe a little bit here and there, but not quite this extreme. And we really like it. I wouldn't be surprised if we do more of it because it really, it suits what we do. It kind of, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, I really, I know we talked about this a little bit the last time I spoke to you guys, but I really, it, I, honestly, I mean, obviously I love what we did in the eighties. I love what the band was. I love all four of those records. I love the shows we played, you know, who we were, what we, what we meant to the times and no regrets about anything. But I think what we are now is, is, we're still the Dream Syndicate. We're still the band we just started in the basement in West L.A. with, you know, the four of us, complete amateurs, finding our way. But um, 
we're something new at the same time. And I think this record is like the culmination of who we've been, what we what we set out to do. And um, whereas the records we made in the 80s were four very different records that reflected four different impulses, the last three feel like all of a whole. And I think that we've kind of getting deeper and deeper into this thing that we are now. And it's exciting to see what we'll go next. Wow. Well, and I mean, I, I hate to stop you at any time <laughs> because we love talking to you, but just a reminder, April the 10th, the universe inside comes out. Uh, also, you'll get to hear and see the longing and make sure at this point, everyone's seen and heard the regulator and like, so. yeah. seeing yeah. the, the full, the full cut, the full 20 minutes. Cause, uh, yeah. But now everybody's got time. Like you said uh, recently on a, what was that, on a Facebook post? Why do, yeah. why do you want to even go for that four minute cut? You gotta What's go. What's the hurry? <laughs> no hurry. Plenty of time. Oh my god. I mean, god. It, I mean, it's funny because like we've been talking about that, and I really, you know, again, I, I was kind of hesitant to how I would, you know, there's obviously we're talking about this and a record I'm very excited about and want to talk about, but there's this giant, you know, as they say, the 800 pound elephant in the room, and like this, we're all in the midst of this thing, and there's a lot of confusion and anxiety and pain and hopefully you know all of your listeners and all of your your friends and family and all their friends and family and everybody's doing okay and going to make it out of this okay and you know and, and i know jeffrey you're doing a lot of great work and you know you're you're right in the middle of it in a lot of ways so, i mean it's a heavy time and to be the same and then we made this long jam and talk about it feels weird but i i would say that i think that this record you know, it's it's it feels. I think sort of the 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 escapism, the psychedelic nature of it, the whatever it is. It feels like it just it's what I need to hear right now, and and if it if it somehow fits the moment to me. So, may if people, if anybody gets any kind of pleasure from the record, any kind of you know, um, anything from the videos, whatever, great. Hopefully, it'll it'll, it'll resonate with people somehow. It absolutely uh, does with me. Yes, and it's, yeah. it's it it really helps me get through. I'm at this point working seven days a week and this record in particular is very helpful to get me through and get everything that done that needs to be done but i really appreciate steve what this record that you guys have done together and for taking the time to talk to us about it and walk us through it and i cannot wait for this to hit the streets i cannot wait to oh hear, hear the feedback Thanks. It's almost there. Almost. We're almost there. Yeah. Thank you so much, Steve. We always and, enjoy and talking to you. Go ahead. And we can't wait to get them. We can't wait to get, get out there and play it live too. So just everybody check it out, and we'll be seeing all of you very soon. We hope. Yes, I was so looking forward to seeing the baseball project, but that will happen sometime. We'll. we'll yeah. Oh, it we'll, may, that, that that may happen. That's, that's August. Let's be optimistic. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I've, it's on my calendar. Yeah. That's for sure. Okay. Yeah, let's be optimistic. It's, 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 it's still five months away. Let's hope. Yes, let's get some work oh. done before then. Okay, yes, of course. But, but thank you once again, Steve. Yes, thank you so well, much. Always great, it's always great talking to you, and, 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 and both of you take care. You know, um, I, I look forward to we got, to we got to hang out together for a few minutes uh, last month. So I hope we do it again soon. Yes, Absolutely. yes. Absolutely. Give our love you to and Linda. Linda. Take care as well. Yes. Thanks. Uh, for sure. All right. Have a good night, care. Steve. Bye bye. You too. Bye. Dang! Wow. Uh, do we love this guy or what? Look, Steve Wynn is one cool dude, and uh, walking through this album, I mean, it's really impressive. It is. My favorite parts change every day. <laughs> It's one of those records where, when I first heard it, The Regulator, I was like, this song changes everything. Right? <laughs> right? And it, I, I still love that record. And now, like, apropos of nothing, is uh, I just love that song. And that, I mean, there are, I could just, I can name all five of them. <laughs> <Right>? Yes. <Yeah. laughs> and, you know, that's the thing. is like, I think if anyone saw this track, I was like, five songs? What's up with that? Uh... Yeah, 60 minutes and whittled down from 80. Wow. Like I said, I want to know those other 20 minutes that got <laughs> cut off. But you know what? Hats off to John Agnello to 
finding the kind of those natural pauses or at least those natural moments to create, you know, different sections. Yeah. You know, the, he kept referring to them as, as sections versus songs. Um, it's really innovative. It's very different. And it really, you know, I like uh, what he said about um, the band as a whole, that you can kind of see where everyone shines. You can see everyone's artistry and mastery absolutely, in, in, in different parts. And I think that's what makes this so, just such a great listen to. And it's a, it's such a great listen. And is the perfect antidote to what we're living through right now. I agree. I agree. This is a perfect record for these times. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. I see what you're there. Um, no, this is, you know, I, I like that the band is inviting the listener to really disconnect, go inside, and just write it out. And find find those moments of connection as the band just kind of plays on. I cannot, I'm still wrapping my head around this was an 80 minute jam. Yeah. Yeah. And that there were these kind of ebbs and flows is like, here's a moment to cut here. You know, oh, okay, well, here, let's wrap this up in a, you know, and here's the next one. I, I'm just, it's, it's pretty interesting. But yeah, it, and, you know, Jeff and I, and we talked about it with Pat Thomas and with Ronnie Barnett. When uh, Dream Syndicate was in Los Angeles uh, in February, February 15th, it seems so long ago. It does. Um, we heard like little moments of this album just kind of seep through, kind of kick in. And, you know, Jeff and I would just kind of look at each other and go, oh, what, what's really happening here? <laughs> you could sense this real excitement and energy i think you said it perfectly like there's a real different vibe and energy um and it was fun and so you know there's there was a lot of hope and um excitement around this this new release and it's still there it's still there yeah and it would not be released at a better time agreed agreed like, and we've been so, sit, sitting on the record for two, almost two months now, so ooh, and we're still ooh, excited about it, right? Yeah, it's it's. Oh my god, yeah, uh, really fun. Cannot wait for you all to hear it. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, Anti Records does have um, pre-order for the album, and of course, you're gonna want a bundle. Yes, There's, but um, they have a lot of different options, uh, LP, CD, and also a download. Um, worth, worth the time, but boy, I cannot wait for this video to be released and for everyone to see that too, because if the regulator went, um, longing's gonna, yes, gonna, gonna give you, gonna give you something something to hold on to yeah so if you haven't seen it yet go watch it now yes go to the youtubes <laughs> all right but, right. Oof, i like talking to steve Wynn. he's amazing he's pretty damn cool jeff i don't even know how we end this should we just leave it be we should all right man gente agrubiar Groove on, Paisley people. Welcome to Jackson Heights, everybody. For those of you who don't know, Jackson Heights is just a uh, Three stops on the subway from Manhattan, but right now it seems like a really long ways away. Um, anyway, hope you're all doing well out there.
Um, things change day by day, of course. I try to pick out songs that feel like they might fit the moment with that, you know, getting to Marvin, but I'm gonna do this one and send this one out to my friend Mia, um, the daughter of Chris Brady. If you go on Chris Brady's um, Facebook page, um, become a friend of his, and you should. He's a good guy, old pal. You can see his um, daughter, I'm guessing, well, I shouldn't guess how old, the young daughter, doing an amazing dance on her bed to this song. So it inspired me to do this one. It's called Sustain. The more I see, the less I think I want to see, which only Makes me dare to see more than I really should I test myself to see what can endure beyond the point of anything that anyone has tried to suffer through before and Only the pain remains Sustain, sustain, sustain Nothing the time can't explain the way Like a debt that I never tried to pay before and no one's ever gonna take the be away from me I try to fit the books with artifacts and elements and bits of me that I can't see I got that lyric wrong just when Jason tuned in and only the pain remains sustain, sustain, sustain nothing the time can explain away the pain remains sustain, sustain, and on 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 And only the pain remains Sustain, sustain, sustain Nothing the time can explain away And only the pain remains Sustain, sustain Sustain, everybody, sustain.